Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a fun and innovative show for you this evening. Austin Meyer is here, the founder and creator of x as well as so many other cool things that we're gonna learn about and talk about this evening. Before we get started, just a couple things. First of all, we are deep into our Fly to Win Challenge in Social Flight. All you have to do is get the free app, Social Flight, on phone, on your iPhone, on your uh, iPad, or uh, over on an Android device. And we have already given away several Zulu 3 headsets. There's more to come. All you have to do is fly and check in. So be sure to check that out. And of course, when you go to socialflight.com, there are tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations and so much more. We want you to get out there and fly. The other thing, of course, is that we are in education season and Social Flight has a partnership with the FAA for on-demand education that can get you WINGS credits, can get you aviation maintenance technician credits towards your AMT awards program. And if you are an IA with uh, you're looking for your renewal through credits through education, you can get legal IA renewal course credits by watching it in Social Flight. And we will print out a certificate of completion for you for each hour that you do. And you can use that for your renewal. Now, tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Lightspeed Aviation. Lightspeed's been a strong supporter of Social Flight, and they have been transforming aviation headsets into safety wearables with their new Tango Zulu headset with carbon monoxide detection, customized audio profiles, flight audio recording, and so much more. I've been flying with it for a while. It is very cool. I'd encourage you to go and check it out for yourself. And of course, thanks to Lightspeed, for helping keep all of this free to everyone from social flight. Now, if you have ever sat in front of the, an amazing flight simulator such as X-Plane, then you have my next guest to thank for that. Austin Meyer created X-Plane way back in 1995 under his company, Laminar Research. It remains the leading commercially available flight simulator that can run on Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. That said, Austin's story goes well beyond flight simulation. He's an accomplished pilot, a philanthropist, an investor in numerous emerging high-tech uh, technologies, and he is deeply involved in emerging education for both air and ground vehicles. Uh, but above all, I'd just like to mention that he is a champion and defender of other innovators like himself. His movie, The Patent Scam, is an eye-opening and somewhat terrifying look into the world of patent trolls and how this industry destroys lives and also stifles innovation from around the globe. I'm going to bring him on the line now to join us here on the show. Please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Austin Meyer. Hi, how are you, Austin? Hey, doing great. First of all, thank you for everything that you do. And I really mean that sincerely. My kids grew up using X-Plane and, and we've, we've got a setup that just keeps growing and growing and growing um, with wraparound screens and you name it. And I've, I just, I'm always behind the curve and I continue to be amazed that something like this exists and that it can actually be just a, a single person with an idea that kicked it off, that got it started and made it possible. Um, so. Let's start by, tell me your story. How did you get to the point of developing x -Plane? Yeah, okay, so that's a fascinating question. I'm actually going to do a YouTube video on that in a few weeks, so I guess you're gonna get a sneak preview now on this podcast. And um, so I'll, I'll give you the answer, but in a few weeks I'll have a little video on YouTube with funny little footage that I recreate from like the 80s and things like that. And I'll with much more detail mustache. to come put on a wig like I looked when I was 19. So, you know, we'll, we'll get all that when the time comes, but I guess I'm just gonna give you the off the cuff answer now. So I got my instrument rating and pilot's license at the minimum age 15 or 16, whatever that was here in Columbia, South Carolina, where I currently live. And um, my instrument rating, I was kind of, eh, I wasn't, I wasn't super sharp. And I was like, okay, now I'm gonna try and make the needle come to the center, you know, and I could eventually get it in the approach controllers at Columbia Metro and kind of hold my hands and kind of guide me around. And, you know, some you know, a 16 year old kind of stumbling along. I didn't quite, you know, it didn't quite click with instrument ratings. And then I went out to work for a little aerospace company out in La Jolla, California. And I'm flying in San Diego. And I'm like, it's time for me to take my instrument recurrency check. 
in San Diego. What could go wrong? You know, I'm in their freaking class, bravo. You know, and clearances are coming, you know, cleared ILS 24, maintain heading 230, May 2500, report established at Vicus, cleared now, contact tower. And I'm just kind of like, what, what? When I had to go up, I think I want to say three times because you don't actually fail an IPC. The instructor just says, I'm not signing your book yet. You're going to have to get better at this. And I had to go maybe three times, four times. And now, now as an older, I mean, I'm actually 50 something years old, even if I don't look it, but now as a 50 year old, if someone's like that flying is not good enough, you need to do better. I look at that as a learning opportunity, right? I'm like, oh, now I can get better at a thing. Thank goodness this instructor is being so demanding. Now I'm going to learn all the things I wasn't otherwise going to learn. That's good. But when you're a teenager and you hear that, what do you think? You think, oh, failure. Now I'll never be able to fly. If I don't make this person happy, that invalidates me as a person. You see, when you're a little kid, I kind of have a little theory about evolution. When we're a child, when we're a young person, we want to fit in. When we get a little older, we, we just, we're willing to take risk and learn and tell people what we've learned. And you know, to heck with the consequences. It's all about learning, sharing information, growing. But when you're younger, what do you want to do? You want to fit in and you don't want to make mistakes. And so when I did go up three or four times to get my instrument currency training back then, I viewed that as very traumatic and, and very much of a disappointment. It caused me to question my ability to fly IFR. And um, so I, you know, I went up a handful of times, you know, trying to keep up with this much faster paced, you know, San Fran and San Diego airspace as La Jolla, California. And, um, and after that, I was like, I got to I got to get a simulator. I'm in Piper Archer 2 IFR at the time. I need a simulator to practice my instrument flying in a Piper Archer 2. Well, Microsoft Flight Sim was available back then, but they didn't have a Piper Archer 2. And none of their instrument panel layouts were quite the same as uh, what I had in that Piper Archer 2. And I was like, well, I know Microsoft is not going to change their sim just to suit me. So mm -hmm. my only opportunity here is I'm going to have to do the job myself. No one else is going to do it. They're not going to do it for me. I got to do it myself. And so I wrote a flight simulator uh, in this is at Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, called Archer 2 IFR. And I proceeded to get uh, booted out of Carnegie Mellon for missing my grade point average standards because as far as I could tell, Carnegie Mellon had only one course writing a flight simulator called Archer 2 IFR, you know, and everything else like C, D, F, and, and they booted <laughs> me out. And so, um, you know, when you look at like the, the people like Elon Musk, you know, the real greats, the real greats, they, they, they left college voluntarily, right? They were like this, I got, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. This college is for the birds. And they went out and they did their own thing. I'm not quite up at that level. Okay. I'm, I wasn't at the level, you know, and I'm not at the level I'm going to say, I'm out of college. I'm doing my own thing, but I'm, I'm just close enough to that level to get booted out of college for not, you know, paying attention. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, um, and, and, and do it while actually creating a product. I mean, they're just, yes. that's, that's, yes. that's, that's a very distinguishing yes. factor. Right. Yeah, I was creating the product. And I and then I went to um, Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, which had an aerospace engineering uh, degree. Carnegie Mellon did not. And at Iowa State, I went there because the aero, aerospace engineering, I could roll that into what I learned. So I could take what I learned from the AeroE degree and roll it into the sim. And so Iowa State actually fit me better than Carnegie Mellon because what I was learning, I could apply to the sim. And I graduated then from Iowa State University with X-Plane ready to go. This is around 1995 or something like that. And I was selling uh, online at the very, very, very beginning of, or very close to the very beginning of the internet. And um. Oh, so it was initially called Archer 2 IFR, but I didn't know exactly what the official technical flight dynamics of the Piper Archer were, right? We can all look up a takeoff distance and a POH and a cruise speed and a climb, right? And I can measure those off the real airplane. But all the things like the stability derivatives and the fugoid times and the pitch and roll, the short and long period oscillations. And for, for people that don't know, this is just all the, the technical ways that exactly define how an airplane handles. That's not in the operating handbook. And there's no way Piper was going to tell me what they learned, you know, in their certification process where they probably had to measure all this stuff. And so the only way that I could figure out how to tell how a Piper Archer would fly was to mathematically break the airplane down into a bunch of little pieces and find how the air interacted with each piece using the first principles math that I was learning at Iowa State University. You wow. see what I mean? It yeah. wasn't, I didn't know how to fake it. And since I didn't know how to fake it, I only had one option left, 
do it the right way. Do it interact yeah. with the geometry. I, could, I didn't know how to do it the wrong way. The right way was the only option left to me. And so I broke this Piper Archer down mathematically into many pieces, the wings, the tails, the prop, the fuselage, the landing gear, everything. And I interacted the air with each little bit of the airplane mathematically many times per second. And once I had done that, suddenly a little light bulb went off of my head saying, wait a minute, this doesn't apply to a Piper Archer 2 IFR anymore. It applies to airplane X, any airplane. I need to call this thing X-plane. I wow. switched the name from Piper Archer 2 IFR to X-plane. And boom, there you go. You got yourself a sim that will simulate any aircraft if you enter the geometry of that aircraft and do with first principles math so you can prove that it works right. And wow. so that's how X-Plane got its start. How about the, the world around you? I mean, uh, most of the beginning of, of my career with some of the companies was in synthetic vision and understanding all the mapping. When you go back to 1995, what, what did you have to work with to build the world around you that you were going to fly within? Okay, so um, initially it was just an artificial horizon. It might as, might as well have been a six pack, like an old link trainer or something like that. And I don't remember exactly what version I went to three dimensional worlds, but I think it was version one. I think version 1.0 did have a three dimensional world. Because again, Microsoft at the time, I think they found some way to fake it, like take a horizon or a flat plane and then put an airport on the flat plane. But I don't understand how you do that since not every airport is at the same elevation. So how does one flat plane hold them up? I don't know how that's possible. And so they, I guess they had some way to fake it that I didn't understand. Or maybe they just had all the airports at the same elevation, even though that's not how the real world actually works. But it was the same as if, if I don't know how to fake it, how about do it the right way? And yeah. so I put a real honest to goodness three dimensional world into X plane. And I, I think that was, I think that was version 1.0. I think the very first version I shipped did have a three dimensional world. Now that world was defined by little points. Okay. It wasn't all these magnificent textured polygons. It was just a bunch of little, it's like a cloud of points, but these points representing city lights would be at an elevation associated with the three dimensional model where the runway would be as well. And so it was not long at all before I was over, oh, this is back when we had America Online. And so I needed an elevation map for the planet Earth, okay? And this is back, do you remember America Online? Oh, I needed yeah. the, you know, the slow download. I found a place in the United States Geological Survey where you could download a teeny little bit of the world, you know, an elevation map. And it was an alphabetical order by city name. You'd be like, Albuquerque, you know, you know, and then, you know, Alabama, parentheses, South, you know, so it's like this alphabetical list of elevation maps. But if you, was, if you had stitched them all together, you had the entire planet Earth. And so my America Online bill that month was like $5,000 or something like that, is I downloaded every bit of the elevation of every bit of planet Earth in alphabetical order by city name over America Online. And so it's just the most ridiculous ridiculous and i you know and i'm constantly listening to that mode and be you know doing, I'm starting and as soon as one you know I'd, I'd see you know and everything was so slow back then be like all right the next download is going to finish at 3 37 a.m all right it's 11 p.m now that's four hours of sleep set my alarm for 3 37 a.m sleep for four hours beep 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 3 37 all right there we go the file's finishing on time start now it's time for boise idaho we're doing the bees and so um it was just like this wartime effort, 24 hour a day, you know, night, daytime, doesn't matter, getting this list of elevation data. And um, eventually I had the, the full elevation data for the whole planet Earth. And so what do I got at that point? Three dimensional model of the Earth, first principles math to define how an airplane flies. It can be applied to any airplane. You're, uh, you're not ready to fly any airplane anywhere. And wow. No, I don't think it had ever been done before. I don't think it had ever been done before. And uh, it was awesome. And it still is awesome to this day. It, it is 100 levels beyond that now today. But also, of course, it's a large team of people, and each one of us does our own little thing. So a huge amount has changed. But it was all me by myself back at the beginning. And it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. That's amazing. And, and, and again, like the internet is basically dial up at that point. You don't have all these people to reach out to for everything. I mean, nope. granted, Nobody. it sounds like maybe you should have bought a plane ticket to the geological survey and just bought stuff. But hey, I, <laughs> the, bottom, the bottom line is that's fascinating. I mean, people take for granted right now all the things that are in our footsteps. Mm -hmm. And for folks that are kind of our age, we can kind of reminisce and say, you know what? It didn't. We didn't used to have the ability right. of getting yeah. all of this data um, when we used to do that. So that is that's incredibly fascinating. 
how how did you then figure out what you could run? Because the processors are very limited. The memory is very limited. Mm -hmm. um, how, was that your, your biggest constraint as you kind of moved ahead at that point? Well, yes and no. So I read an incredible article, and I don't remember exactly what the link was, or I'd share it with you, but an article that said the greatest inventions come from their constraints. It's not what you have, it's what you don't have. You want to solve a Rubik's okay. Cube, what do you have? Five minutes in a plastic cube, right? Like you know, yeah. you want a hula hoop, what do you have? You know, the ability to gyrate, you know, it's, it's, you have a limited, a limited platform. What can you make out of that limited platform? That's where you get the incredible, the iPhone, the iPhone, whatever you've got, it has to, well, I don't know where mine is, it's on another desk, wherever it is, you know, it's, it's got to fit in your pocket. What can you do with this limited size device? I love that. And so the fact that we've had limited RAM, limited memory, limited CPU, limited, uh, you know, capabilities of the computer, this has never been a problem per se. All it does is define the size of the canvas. If the computer is small, then we got a, a, just a, a points in space representing city lights. And mm -hmm. now today, with you know, with X Plane 12, it's freaking three-dimensional volumetric clouds, the sun shining through them. You know, so we simply scale the detail of the world in the simulation to the memory and the CPU that we have. It's not exactly, I mean, it's limiting in the same way that the frame around a portrait is limiting. Is, right. is a frame around the portrait a limit of the portrait? Yeah, but it doesn't diminish what you're doing. You just have to operate within the constraints you're given, but that doesn't make the art worse. I love that. And, and, and you know, I've spent a lot of time around a number of innovators, and I'll point something out that may or may not even be kind of obvious to you as such an innovator, and that is there are, uh, it, it's dawning on me, there are basically two ways of viewing things and that, that different people fit into. One of which is you wait for some new door to open, new technology, new thing that opens it up, and everybody's like, how can I take advantage of all this new space of how to do something? But some of the greatest innovators I have ever met and spent time with worked basically motivated by the constraints that you just said. Instead, they were like, how do I accomplish my dream within these constraints how do i make it happen on something with limited resources that's yep. where the genius has come not just a mad bull rush to hey by the way we just invented something that means you're going to be able to do x y and z and everybody's like well how can i put that to use right so another fascinating thing is when you operate with the constraints of available hardware whatever you make is rapidly available to a lot of people mm. that's true too yeah it's it's almost like a lowest common denominator development Right. Yeah, the hardware, if the hardware is available, by the time you make it, you're operating within a thing that's accessible to many. And so that, wow. that allows for rapid, uh, rapid growth. So what was it like then grow, as, as you're growing this product and you're going there, but realistically it is you against this Goliath of Microsoft and there's no one else. It, what, what, are, what are challenges? So. That, that's a half truth. Let me just point that out. There's something we're not missing here. Microsoft. I never really was going exactly against Microsoft. So Bruce Artwick made a flight simulator and then Microsoft bought it. And now <laughs> the latest Microsoft, it's a French company that makes a new, yeah. mic that makes a new sim. Microsoft yeah, put their label. It's never been their core business. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, so, so what I, it's like, it's the first yep, thing I like say is we can say I'm arguing against, I'm, I'm going against Microsoft. I'm not actually going against Microsoft. I'm going against whatever company Microsoft decided to buy and I'm going up against the customer the customer saying, do I want to get this product from Microsoft? Because they buy the name that they are used to seeing. So just to be clear, I'm, I'm going against a purchase that a big company made and the idea of a big company that's conferred by a label. So no, it's, it's a little bit, sense. a little bit different. Yeah, that makes absolutely perfect sense. Yeah. And, and, and the educated consumer always, especially in aviation, I would hope, always wants to be rooting for the most vested developer, the most vested owner in their product. Someone that cares about customer service and ongoing development and everything else. You look like the names on this board uh, of where I've always preached with avionics, that's been my whole background. It's always been rooting for who's invested, who's working hardest, and who has to play with others, who has to play within constraints to give you the best products possible. And that's exactly what I think you're describing is that's, that's you and Microsoft is like, well, we just bought this thing. Right, it's not exactly David versus Goliath. It's David versus David with the Goliath label, you know, paraded on his forehead and Goliath kind of off in the background going, you're doing what I want, right? You know, it's, <laughs> you know, so it's, 
it let's let's put it this way it it also has had i mean it has been absolutely remarkable to me how little what microsoft does affects x-plane they seem mm -hmm. to both be able to exist each in their own space without one affecting the other and in fact it goes farther than that do you know what steam is steam mm -hmm. Have heard of this? The, the gaming platform. Yes. We yes. came out with X Plane on Steam, and we were afraid as soon as it came out with the Steam version of X Plane that sales from XPlane.com would fall apart. You know, because oh no, we're going to give up our control of the product, and Steam's just going to take it all. We came out with the Steam version of X Plane. Everybody bought it on Steam that wanted to, but it didn't reduce our sales on desktop. Our, our sales on desktop were unchanged. If you huh. want to buy it on Steam, if you're a Steam gamer, you buy it on Steam. You want it on desktop, you buy it on desktop. We came out with X-Plane for iPhone, and that's quite a fun story, some of which I'm not allowed to tell. But um, we came out with X-Plane for iPhone. Um, we were afraid, oh, no, what if this iPhone version of X-Plane hurts our desktop? You know, desktop, Mac, you know, Windows, Linux, you know, on a, on a personal desktop yeah. computer. What if it hurts our desktop sales? We have this cheaper phone version. Do we really want to do this? We come out with the phone version. It had no impact on the desktop sales. You want to play a game on a phone? Play a game on a phone. You want to buy stuff on Steam? Buy stuff on Steam. You want to run a sim on desktop? Run a sim on desktop. None affected the other. And in every case that we were worried sales would go down, it simply didn't happen. And so I believe, I believe this applies even more to Microsoft. If you want to buy a Microsoft Light Sim to see right, what, what is now their latest and greatest scenery, great, do it. But how does that stop you from buying a sim that is much more steeped in actual aviation and the way airplanes actually behave. I don't think it does. And yeah. so in a way, it's it's almost like you almost might not want to say it's X-Plane versus Microsoft, but it's X-Plane and Microsoft. Right. Now, there is one area though, maybe there's maybe there's two areas though, just to kind of be aware of. When Microsoft kind of flubbed the the game a little bit, as they did, they have it with the latest version. The latest version is quite 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 impressive. But in some previous versions, they were like flying through the sky to collect coins, and they were saying you could only have new airplanes if we approve them first. Some real flubs, in my opinion, real flubs. And when they were making these flubs and canceling products, I admit it would become easier for us to kind of say now we can be lazy and still get all the sales. You know, so I'm sure that that happens to some degree. But now that Microsoft has pumped their game up to a pretty high level, as they're doing, we're scrambling that much harder to try and make sure that we stay as good as them or better than them. And uh, so that's more work for us. And of course, ultimately, just better for the consumer. So, um, you know, so so as far as, as us versus Microsoft, it's a little more nuanced than that. It's kind of like us and Microsoft. People, some people like the Microsoft, some people like the X-Plain way of doing things, some people like both, and it, it, it one does not seem to have a tremendous impact on the other in terms of sales, because, right. you know, I mean, it's sort of like, can you have a Burger King and a McDonald's in the world, you know? Well, actually, maybe that's not the best analogy, because Burger <laughs> King and McDonald's are so similar. X-Plain and Microsoft are not similar at all. Can you have a sushi restaurant and a steakhouse in the world? Maybe that's a better analogy. Exactly. Well, but you also brought up something else, which is really important, which have been the healthiest, the most innovative people and companies have always been their own disruptors, mm -hmm. right? They don't sit okay. there on something and say, if we come out with this other product, that, that it's going to eat apart this other part of our business, and that prevents them from doing that. Yeah. If, if, if the minute you do that, someone else is going to be the one to do it. And yeah. then it will be a takeaway business in one way or another. But yeah. the, it's always the best innovators that are that are literally saying, yeah, I'm coming up with something that could destroy what's you know paying my bills right now. But I'm but, taking the risk. Right. So I can I can tell two quick little stories here, and I'll try and be as uh, careful as, as I can to not be too cavalier. But um, one case where I understand this to is, to have happened is when Cessna had the uh, Cessna 441. That airplane is so good, short field runway, quiet, smooth, and they were looking at building an, an upgraded Cessna 441. It would be even better. And I, and I heard, I can't state this for a fact, I can say that I've heard this from pilots that, that, that were involved in this. Cessna saw that this new airplane would be better than the Citation. Like, we don't want to give up the Citation sales, as I understand it. And so the 441 was not continued, even though it could give better performance in, in at least some areas. And yeah. I hate to see what could have been an incredible product not happen. Uh, yeah. because somebody doesn't want to, now this, this is as I understand it from what I've heard. So I just want to be clear that I'm not being cavalier about pretending I know something that I've only heard. But, um, 
Another case, which I think has a much, much, much happier, much happier ending, is uh, when Elon Musk came along and said, well, we can have an electric car. I don't care who it destate, you know, destabilizes. And now I drive my Tesla. Uh, my wife drives a Lucid, both of which are electric, and absolutely, we'll never go back to gasoline. And so, yeah, so those are two cases where there's, there's possible disruption, one being with a turboprop possibly disrupting a jet, and more with an electric car uh, disrupting a gasoline car. And in both cases, I think the disruption should occur, and in one of them, it actually did. Wow. Yeah, I don't think people necessarily even, even see as much of it that exists in companies, because I have seen it firsthand myself in my own career. It's almost like that Indiana Jones like end movie where companies will go out and buy technology, big companies, sometimes because it's, it's damaging what they're doing, and they just roll it into that warehouse uh, you know, and, and stuff it away somewhere because they they don't want it to disrupt what they're doing. And the reality is it never succeeds that way. That never works as a, as a technique. Mm. I guess that's one of the reasons I'm so opposed to the patent system, at least as it's deployed now. Because what a patent lets you do is say, I own this way of doing things and now nobody else is allowed to do it. And so mm -hmm. the idea simply doesn't doesn't come to fruition. Yeah, especially when, um, and I want to get to that a little bit uh, later in the show, but when, yep. when you're dealing with uh, people that are, that aren't innovators, they're doing it as an, as an investment technique or in a legal technique or something that's just based on money. They are not people that are going to use the technology to create and right. to innovate. That's where yep. it gets, that's where it definitely gets to get worse. But before yep. we actually get to that, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, well, aircraft and some of the other things you do it. So you've got, are you it, an evolution now? Is that what you're? Yep. What you're I fly a, a Lancer evolution. I guess most listeners know what that is. Mine, it's some people don't know it's a home built. So it's just a, it's a carbon fiber, uh, carbon fiber bird, pressurized, uh, 850 horsepower, Pratt and Whitney. Prop. Six turbo prop. It runs 300 knots, Mach 0.5, 28,000 feet. It has the exact same stall speed as the Cirrus SR22 to within one knot. And so uh, the Cirrus SR22 does a short field approach at 77 knots. So if I have the same margin as the Cirrus SR22, I can fly an approach at 77 knots. So I cruise at Mach 0.5. I approach the runway at 77 knots, and I don't need any permission from the FAA. You tell me how to beat that. Isn't that amazing? And you know, yeah, amazing. that that's really a, an interesting thing. Where Lancer had the the Lancer 4P that that people were pushing and pushing and pushing that design along. And I my my tell me that what you know about it because my bat my understanding is that Lancer was looking at that at that point and saying, guys, you're just pushing this. We need a new we need a clean sheet. Um, you're pushing this so so much harder even though it's experimental let's let's do this the right way and that's how they came instead of that's how they sort of left the 4p behind and came out with the evolution yeah that's true and the specific way that the airplane is being pushed is it's being too pushed too close to the stall at low altitude the lancer 4 has this high efficiency skinny little wing and when you would stall that thing it would just pop right on over on your roll and you let the speed get you know lower than it needs to be in the traffic pattern it was all over and so the stall spin accidents in the lancer 4 were really really scary and not exactly uncommon and so specifically it was the wing that they wanted to change. And so they put on a much more high lift, friendly stall, low speed capable airplane, which lets that Lancer Evolution get down to the same speed as the Cirrus SR-22, two within one knot. Now, you'll notice I said the stall speed is the same within one knot, so I can use the same short field approach as the Cirrus. You may have caught that as a tiny little bit cagey there, and there's a reason for it. When you have 850 horsepower, if you are at 77 knots in that airplane, you like, no, I'm going to add 850 horsepower. You're going to twist that thing around on its own engine torque so fast, you know, that you're just going to be like, Bleh! I mean, yeah, you're still going to put it in the ground in a crazy, you know. so, you know, if you use the 77 knot approach speed on that airplane, your go around should feel like uh, the go around of a hot air balloon, you know, it's just like, <laughs> add a little power add a little more, okay, let it float up, good. You know, there's no concept that you have in a Skyhawk where it's like, go around, Blah! you know, there's no concept of that in a Pratt & Whitney PT-6, no concept, right? You'd over torque it, over temp it, you know, uh, torque roll it, the whole thing would, so you have to fly the Lancer Evolution with respect. In mm -hmm. that, as the speed comes down, the power better come down with it because the airframe isn't gonna absorb all that power down at low speed. Um, 
it doesn't make the airplane dangerous, but it means you add power and you feed in the power gradually as the speed builds. It's the easiest thing in the world to do, but um, that's what you do. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so the evolution was built to try to solve the low speed handling problems that the 4P had. And in addition to that, while they were at it, they said, what do customers want? And customers wanted more, more room and more baggage. And oh boy, did they get it. That airplane is big. So, I mean, I'm well over six feet and I got plenty of room and I travel with my family and I've had boatloads of computers, radio control airplanes. I mean, I've had that so much cargo capacity, so much room, and then that big fat wing for good low speed handling when you hear, wait a minute, it's got all this room and a big fat wing, how does it go fast? Well, there's only one way to go fast if you have that kind of frontal area and wing area, and that's to go high, right? Because otherwise the air is just too thick and the body is too big and the wing is too big. And so at 28,000 feet, that's as high as we can go, you know, while staying under reduced vertical separation minima. And, uh, and this is as high as I'd want to go anyway in a single pressurization system like that thing has. And so when you get to that thin air, then that big wing and that big body don't matter quite so much anymore because there's not as much air for them to push against. And so altitude uh, is the secret that gives the Mach 0.5 wing area with a nice big fat wing plenty of lift is the secret to getting that 77 knot approach speed and uh the a large fuselage frontal area that is only efficient up high is the secret to, to having the roomy cabin so the evolution has a number of oh and then the efficiency comes from the fact it's got that tiny little 850 horsepower turbine we know which is like the size of a little office trash can but a small turbine cannot deliver its power to the air efficiently unless it can distribute that power across a lot of air. How do you distribute all that power across a lot of air? A big freaking prop. There's no other answer. This is why jets do not work properly at low speed. Jets cannot work at low speed because they can't distribute all that power across a large amount of air. And that's why airliners have such gigantic fans these days and jet airliners have gotten to bigger engines. Um, so the evolution, the other secret of the evolution is a tremendous amount of power in a small little package that distributes itself across a very large prop to a large amount of air, grabbing a lot of air is what allows the efficient propulsion system. So the evolution has all these incredible secrets hidden in plain sight, you know, when you know what to look for. I'm going to show that uh, a picture of that right now, sure. and then we also do podcasts there so everybody can, can kind of see That's this. Yep. You fly it with a four blade now? Yeah, four blade MT. It's a wooden prop. Some people have metal props on there, but the metal props can get into like a resonance where they vibrate and stuff gets damaged or something like that if you idle it too slow in RPM or something. I have a German MT prop, which is like German birch wood wrapped in carbon fiber. And <laughs> that wood like absorbs the vibrations in such a way that you don't have any resonance problems at all. So I can operate that thing at any any speed, no no resonance problems. So is that where, when we start seeing out of like TBM and some of the other companies, they keep coming up with more and more blades uh, on their turbo props. Is that where this is, where that's a lot, a lot of that's coming from? Here's why. Here's why they have more blades. This is the reason for it. All right. So now, now this, <laughs> all right, I guess we don't have time for you to do the whole whiteboard presentation, but we'd be at it for 30 minutes for just this question. So let me get the short answer. Here's what it is. <laughs> when the propeller is not moving very fast, it's all about the disc area, the size of the disc. Why is it about the disc area? Well, because if you have a certain amount of horsepower available, you're gonna do it by accelerating air. That's how you're, that's how you're gonna turn that power into thrust, you're accelerating air. How much air are you gonna accelerate? Well, the amount that's contained in that propeller disc. It actually doesn't matter how many blades there are, does it? Two blades, a thousand blades, it actually makes no difference. Just the width. I'm grabbing the air that is surrounded by, you know, this defined by this, this propeller disc. The propeller disc is connected to the radius of the prop, not the number of blades. And so people think, you know, more blades, more power. Oh, not so fast. When you are talking about accelerating air and kicking out the back, what matters is how much air you grab. How much air you grab is the disc area. The disc area is the propeller radius or diameter. How many blades are in there makes no difference. So how's that for a little mind blow? It doesn't matter how many blades you have, not when you're going slow. But now let's say you start to pick up some serious speed. Let's say you're going half the speed of sound and you're, so you're doing 300 knots. Well, when you're going 300 knots, you are ingesting an insane amount of air through that prop disc just because you're moving forward. Think of this Pac-Man, right? If Pac-Man is playing the game and each, each, a uh, little circle point that he grabs is a pound of air. Well, the faster that Pac-Man is going forward, the more air he's grabbing, even though his mouth didn't get any bigger, right? So as the airplane speeds up, the size of that propeller isn't what 
so important anymore because you're grabbing the air because you're moving forwards through it, not because mm -hmm. you grab more laterally. So now you're grabbing a ton of air. And here's something really weird. When you're going at 300 knots forwards, you might only be kicking the air back at another 10 knots or 15 knots. You don't have a tremendous amount of prop wash. You sit behind the Lancer Evolution on the ground at full power. It's like, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 knots or, or more. But when the airplane's going forward at 300 knots, it might only be accelerating the air by 10 or 15 miles an hour. And it accelerates the air so little because it's grabbing so much of it. You see, the more air it grabs, the less it accelerates each bit that it does grab. And it's grabbing so much because it's advancing rapidly into it. So now the dynamics have changed. It's not about how much air you can grab and accelerate. It's about what angle of attack you're operating that blade and how much load you can put on each blade. And if you have a thousand horsepower going to two little blades and this one little blade is trying to absorb 500 horsepower, it ha might have to open up that pitch so much to absorb that power that it goes up to such a high angle of attack that it stalls in the extreme case, or it's operating behind the power curve in a fairly bad case, or operating beyond at a higher angle of attack than its optimum angle of attack in the, in the likely case. In other words, when you dump in a boatload of power, you're going forward so fast that the amount of air you are getting is not the thing. It's the load on each individual blade that's the thing. That's when you have to start adding more blades. And mm. so that's why when you look at these airplanes that have a lot of blades, they're always the faster ones. There's yeah. a European turboprop transport that looks like a modern answer to the C-130. I forget what it's called. So somebody after this can Google it. But it's this European modern C-130 it's got like 10 blades on there or something crazy like that. And a swept wing. It's a propeller airplane with a swept wing. And the swept wing is the proof that it likes to approach the speed of sound, right? That's the proof. And so this airplane likes to approach the speed of sound, but it still does it with a propeller. So this is one fast plane for a prop. And um, it's like got like 10 blades because at a standstill, he'd probably be just fine with two blades. It's only how much air he grabs in that disc that matters. But when he's picking up 400 knots, which is what I bet this guy can do, uh, or maybe even better, he's doing 400 knots, each blade is advancing into the air in its own little world. And the more blades you have, the more power you can absorb. Wow. So that explains, I think MT is going for like a seven or a nine. There was something crazy that I remember seeing recently. They're only doing that if they mean to go fast. Wow. Wow. That is, that's amazing. So Talk to me about some of the other cutting edge technology things that you've been doing. You, there's a video out where, uh, where you have purchased electric buses for mm -hmm. your local area. You're working on the Beta EV Tall. Yep. Uh, what, are your, what, are, what are your thoughts on some of this? Okay, well, why don't we just get the buses out of the way because that's just a quick and easy one. And then we can maybe spend a little more time on beta because that's much more fascinating for aviation. So I was just watching a, a YouTube channel called Now You Know. They talk about Teslas and stuff like that. And they're talking about how diesel pollution from buses damages the organs of developing children. It damages almost all organs, particulate matter, the fine particulate matter it gets into like your liver and your lungs and everything. It, I mean, it, it even hurts IQ. Uh, more pollution, a child is exposed to more pollution as he's growing up, it actually has a measurable impact on IQ. And when, when these now you know guys are measuring, they're saying, and if your IQ is lower, then that means you have less job earnings potential later on in life. We'll talk about like not even beginning to address the true horror of the situation. Right. You know, if, 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 your, if your ability to, to innovate and think and create and enjoy and then and, and laugh and, and do all, all the things that are hard mentally to do, but are so rewarding if you can do them. If that's taken away by being exposed to pollution, yeah. oh my God, we have screwed up. We yeah. have really screwed up. And, and kids ride school buses and each bus is right behind the bus in front when they come <laughs> and go. Each kid yeah. is getting the pollution from the bus in front of him. Yeah. And so on, um, yeah, so I found some uh, schools manufacturers, and I said, uh, we, we got to buy some electric school buses for South Carolina. And um, how much are they? And they told me, and I said, mark it down so I can afford three. And they said, fine. And uh, so um, I, bought, uh, I bought three school buses, and they gave me a fourth for free. So um, I bought four electric school buses for, um, for South Carolina. And this is about maybe two years, a year, maybe two years before – um the the current presidential administration decided to buy like a boatload more um that's wonderful 
So, so just, I just want to say that's absolutely wonderful. And yeah, I, it, I it really felt good to you. Do. Now, all right. So just to be a little bit, a little bit interesting here, or or slightly maybe cynical, to be a little cynical about this. Um, so first things first. The way I distributed the buses was I found the routes that were the longest while still operating within the battery range limits of the bus. That's not what the what the Joe Biden administration did. They did not send the buses out based on where they would get the most miles, where they would do the most good. They had to do everything based on race and income and you know historically disadvantaged. They had to do all their 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 liberal biases. And I'm, so many people they they listen to this, oh Austin bought electric buses. He drives a Tesla. He must be a liberal. Yeah, right. Uh, no, I, there was no liberal bias in my distribution of the buses. I chose the buses for the routes that would give the most miles within. Mm battery capability of the vehicle because that will remove the most pounds of pollution from entering the lungs of children. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I deployed the buses in a way that is logically fair, free right. of the bias I constantly see in the media and the government. So, um, so I, I did that to help and I chose the routes to do as much helping as I could possibly do. And uh, so sorry for getting off in, in my soap. No, 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 that, I mean, that is you wonderful. Electric buses, right. what, is Joe Biden your best friend? Uh, no, no, I don't want children to be damaged by pollution. Um, so let's talk, sure hold I, on, I'll let me switch you over, though. I want to talk, you want to talk controversy. I want to talk yeah. about EV tall and the, the uh, in, you want to really talk con urban air mobility. And right. I'm going to put this out to you. So okay. I am a, a someone who, you know, as you lived through the whole, you know, light jet, very light, VLJs are going to darken yes. the skies and be the next big thing. We also what Stop happened with million that. dollar jet. Exactly. I've I'm, I'm going to my question is going to be how explain this, explain how this is going to turn out to me, because and the, the foundation that I'd like you to help enlighten me about is because I've been to these conventions. It, we've had vertical takeoff and landing, right? It exists, right? It's just a price point. It's not that helicopters don't exist. It's that they're extraordinarily expensive. If all of a sudden they were $30,000, we wouldn't have any infrastructure to handle everybody using them getting places. So what's going to change? Tell me what the future is likely to be that you see with eVTOL and the work that you're doing. Okay. okay. Before I even answer the question, I've, I first of all, whenever I've mentioned this on YouTube, I've seen the comments. Okay. So I'm going to address the comments first. Okay. And after I've addressed the comments, then I'll tell you what the future is actually going to be. First of all, EV tolls, they're not going to be as expensive as helicopters. They're going to be more expensive. My Tesla is more expensive than a Ford Mustang. Oh yeah. Well, an old gas burning core Ford Mustang, but it's also, oh yeah, way better. Um, EV tolls to be more expensive than helicopters, not less expensive. Um, that's the first thing I need to put out there. Uh, the next thing I put out there is when they're so expensive, it will not make sense for you to buy one. Nobody's going to buy their own Jetsons vehicle. I mean, me owning a Lance Revolution is an economic disaster. I paid well over a million dollars for the thing. I fly it once a week. Think of the utilization on that. And when you did the cost in dollars per hour of operating that airplane, it ain't the fuel. It ain't the exorbitantly expensive engine. It's not the hangar. It's not the maintenance. Although maintenance on the Lance Revolution is basically nothing. I mean, it's an experimental carbon fiber surfboard with a with an aluminum engine there's basically no maintenance all to be done on an evolution so no the, the cost of a lance of owning a lancer evolution is the fact that that million really million and a half dollars in the stock market would have been making me one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year now i'm not making that one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year because i'm flying i've got it tied up in an airplane so EV tolls are going to be expensive, not to operate, but to acquire. And they're going to be expensive to own because the opportunity cost of not having that money invested elsewhere. Um, oh, another thing, you know, batteries don't carry as much energy as, as, as gas. You know, they don't go as far, right? And what you see, and, and you see this in AvWeb, this is always all the comments on AvWeb, you know, well, it, it, it can't go as far as a gas burning airplane. I'll stick with gas, thanks. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Does a Cessna 172 go as far as a Boeing 747? No. Does that mean the Cessna 172 is useless? Oh, the Cessna 172, it doesn't go as far as an airliner. I guess the airplane has no use. You see, so, so does battery go as far as, as gasoline? No. Or EV toll is going to be cheap? No. But is there a use case for them? If you're going to look at this and say, how do I replace a Boeing 747? But electric. 
you're going to get a stupid answer. No, you don't do that. That wouldn't work. Do I take a SESTA 172, but electric? No, that would make no sense. You're not going to have even the same performance as a Skyhawk. Let me ask you this. What if you want to go five miles from LaGuardia Airport to a building top off of Central Park? You want to make it from LaGuardia to Central Park. That is five miles. It's an hour in traffic. I've done it many times. What if you do that in seven minutes in three-dimensional so, space? So that's where the question comes in. Like, I'm not doubting the tech. Let's say the technology gets there, not down the economics will get there, not down the need is there. The, what, we're, what we're not hearing a lot about is if we look at it as a, transfer, a completely transformative technology by existing that can do what you said, that can get people these short distances in urban environments much quicker. Do you see that actually happening on a mass scale? Are we thinking in the infrastructure that that can happen on a mass scale with all the things that you and I know about air traffic and what it requires? I do not know the answer to that question. I will, I will say a few things. What it's so easy to say at this point, what people say all the time is, you'll never get it certified, you'll never have an air traffic control system that can handle it, you'll never be able to get them all charged. But I mean, those three arguments are so feeble. What mm. is the FAA? That's what we say it is. Do you know the FAA, they refuse to take lead out of gas for what, a century? Mm -hmm. decades at least many many decades half a century we have known that lead in aviation fuel was damaging since the 1800s it was something like back in the 1800s when uh this person that figured out Apple. you could make a cadillac go faster if you put lead in there he died of lead poisoning by the way he was in, he was all like this from all the lead at the end of his life and he got hung up in his own hammock that he had to lie in because he couldn't get in and out of bed um but uh that lead has been in there forever in the FAO. Oh, we can't take it out. Oh, I, I don't know. And then one person got uh, put in charge. I don't think this person is in charge there. It's somebody in charge of finance or something like that. I don't remember who she was, but this one person came along and said, screw this. We're taking the lead out. And like the, the next day there was like a rule that said all aviation fuel or all airplanes are now allowed to run unleaded. Do you remember that? This is only a few months ago that this happened. Well, it they was, finally allowed the STC. Yes, I understand. But it's for all airplanes. And now there's only one question. How fast can Ed, what, Ed Braley, George Braley, the, the gaming sector guy? Yeah. How He's fast back. can he start, you know, doing his thing and ramping up? So in other words, the government can change what they tell us we're not allowed to do like mm -hmm. that. So the whole idea of, you know, oh, FAA won't allow it. No, I don't, I don't buy that. The FAA is made up of Americans and Americans uh, are going to, are going to, are going to take, are going to make the right decision in the long run. Maybe not in the short run. Maybe it takes us a little while to figure out what it is. But the FAA is going to be what we want the FAA to be. Um, okay. It will so be. So ultimately, certain. you're saying we're going to get to a point where the technology is kind of proving itself, and it's there, and people are chomping at the bit because they know that they can hop five, ten, fifteen, twenty miles and and make these things happen quickly. And when they see all the resistance that exists in the current world to, you know, having a rooftop, uh, you know, a place to land, air traffic control managing it and all these other things, the pressure on the government and the, uh, therefore the FAA at that time will cause a massive shift to have to happen to accommodate I, it all. I, I guess I just believe that the world is always going to work that way in the long run. Um, let me just talk about two more. The other was electrical charging infrastructure. Well, mm -hmm. my, my theory is there's, there's a lot of electrical plugs in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, 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 we can deliver electricity, we can deliver more electricity. I mean, we're now charging, I mean, I, I supercharge my Tesla by the side of the road in 30 minutes now. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and it was such a short time ago that the best electric car you could find was a GM Impact which is like 15 seconds, zero to 60, short range, kind of go eh, when you drive it. And now, I mean, my Tesla will outrun Ferraris in the real world. No question. No question. I've owned both, by the way. I know exactly what I'm talking about. In the real world, Teslas will outrun Ferraris. I speak from personal experience with significant time behind the wheel of both cars. Um, so uh, th we've seen the shift happen with cars, and it's now to the point that gas burning cars are just embarrassing. On, on YouTube, there's a video, uh, Lucid versus Bugatti Chiron, and the yes. Lucid Air, which my wife drives, it's, it's six feet below me right now in the garage. I can carry the laptop down there and show it to you if you want. It's 
it is faster than a Bugatti Chiron from in, in the in the quarter mile. And it's got the luxury of like a Rolls Royce. It's and it's like 150 grand or something like that. You know, it's as expensive as a nice Mercedes. It, it, gas burning cars are now an embarrassment when you've seen what electric cars can actually do. Will we see the same thing with aviation? That's the question you're actually asking. And um, I'm not gonna waste time saying, oh, this is gonna happen in the future because people will say, oh no, that's not gonna happen. Don't you know an electric airplane is not as fast as a Cesta 172. You know, we've seen this with cars, but so now let's get, let me get a little bit more nuanced, okay? Um, what does electrical vertical transportation give us? What does it give us? Well, what does an electric motor gives us? It gives us instant torque. And it gives us that instant torque with complete silence. What do batteries give us? Power to turn the electric motor with zero pollution at the source, zero pollution in the total chain. If you get your power from nuclear or solar or hydro or wind and less pollution than a reciprocating engine if you get your power from uh, natural gas or coal. And that, that statement is true. Some people say, oh, well, what's the point of having an EV if you're just powered by coal? Well, first of all, the world is not entirely powered by coal. Right, but right. secondly, because electric motors run at about 95% efficiency, but gas burning motors and cars run at about 20 to 25% efficiency, even if you get power from a coal power plant to charge your Tesla, you still come out ahead environmentally because yep. of the 95% efficiency in delivery of power from the battery through the inverter. It's literally like almost 95% efficiency from battery to crankshaft. Um, so the, the efficiency is so good, you still come out ahead. But um, when you've got instant torque, no noise, there is still noise from the propeller. And that's something that's going to be, that's going to have to be dealt with. But um, no noise, instant torque, less pollution in the worst case, no pollution in the best case. And of course, I can see that the comments now, well, what about the pollution associated with making the battery? Well, okay, there's also pollution associated with laying up the carbon fiber skins in our airplane. You know, at some point you gotta, you gotta stop using your, your excuses to try to, you know, avoid understanding something new. But um, when, when you have these ingredients in, in, at, at play, the, the question goes, well, what can you do with them? And I think the answer is you can deliver short range, quiet, clean transportation and instant torque has been the enabling technology for all these little drones of which there are you know, mm -hmm. millions because yep. you can rapidly put torque at any corner of your vehicle to maneuver it any way you want. And so when you've got an instant torque, which means quickly maneuverable, uh, minimal emissions to in the best case zero emissions, silent, short-range transport, what do you do with that? And the answer is you go, whoop, zzz, whoop, that's what you do with that. Right. Where do you want to go? Zzz, zzz, zzz. Not as far as an airliner, not as fast as a Lancer Evolution, not as far as a Lancer Evolution, but is there any use case to going up, going a little ways at 100 knots, and then coming down? Is there a ways? Well, I'm sitting there going, I wish I was, I wish I was, I wish I was every time I'm stuck in traffic. Right. And um, so... Uh, so let me tell you just a little bit more. Now let's go into a little more detail. Are we going to have flying cars? I believe we will never have flying cars. A flying car is the thing that drives on the road and then takes off into the sky. That's a flying car. The problem is for a car to be on the road, it has to be the width of a lane of traffic. But remember I was talking about air propellers can only work right and engines can only work right if they can grab a lot of air, right? It, that's why jet engines don't work well at low speed. Any propulsive system can only work right if it grabs a lot of air. Well, how do you grab a lot of air if you're not allowed to be any li wider right. than a lane of traffic? You can't. This is why airplanes have these big, beautiful wings stretching out so far in every direction. We have put these big wings on there for a reason. We put propellers yeah. instead of jets for low-speed travel for a reason. It's so we can grab a lot of air. A well, flying we've, also, we, we've seen a lot of companies try to do that and fail at doing that. What the, let Tell me what you think the bottom line is going to be as to, you know, roughly how long it's going to be before we start seeing those distances in, I a, don't way know. That, in, a, way the, in a way the average person might even be able to participate. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but I think I do know what is going to happen. And I said I wouldn't predict the future, but I think I've laid I still want you to predict the future. Come on, man. <laughs> well, I've laid enough first principles physics in the last 10 minutes 
to, to hopefully present what's going to happen. What happens when you have, you, you cannot have a flying car. You have to grab a lot of air. You cannot fit on a road. Oh, also this doesn't scale up a tremendous amount. If you make an airplane twice as long, twice as wide, and twice as tall, in other words, twice as big, it's eight times the weight, but only four times the wing area. Eight times the weight, but only four times the disc area. So rotors, that means the disc loading comes up. As the disc loading comes up, the efficiency comes down. So these things are also not going to get really, really big. Mm -hmm. um, there's be a, a size limit. So you're somewhat limited on size, limited on range, but you've got the advantages of the low pollution and the instant torque. What are we going to get? What can you get with those pieces, right? You know, God or evolution or luck or the Big Bang, whatever it is, gave us these pieces to play with. How, how do you assemble those pieces? And here's how we're going to assemble them, and I believe I'm, I'm pretty comfortable making this prediction. We don't have a flying car. And also because, as I said, this thing's going to be very, very expensive. We're not going to buy it for ourselves. And I, right. I've seen how people drive. I don't want them flying. <laughs> I don't want them <laughs> flying with me. Okay? So I don't want to see other people up there driving. I've seen, you know, flying. I've seen how they drive. There's not going to be uh, room for them if people are like, oh, all over the sky. They're going to be expensive to buy, but cheap to operate, right? And a, a Tesla or Lucid, it all comes back to Tesla or Lucid because we've seen all this. We just, version one is on the road. Version two is in the air. But um, we, uh, we, we got something that's expensive to purchase because it's so new and high tech and cutting edge, but cheap to operate because there's no gas or turbines or reciprocating moving parts or anything like that. What does that lend itself to? Here's what it lends itself to. A fleet operator owns a handful of these expensive vehicles. And these expensive vehicles can only pay their way, well, the same way an airliner pays its way. It's just like an airliner. You own an airliner, not for yourself, you own it because you can have it doing work for you, paying its rent, paying its way, preferably all day, every day. I mean, there's airline flights in the middle of the night, for goodness sake. We take red eyes. They're still in use. Um, and we're going to see the same thing with the VTOLs. A company is going to have a handful of them. They're going to be constantly working, and they will only be able to operate between areas that are at least, oh, I don't know, 50 feet on a side, 60 feet on a side, a building top, a parking lot, a parking garage. Um, they'll be able to operate from areas that give, well, whatever it would take to operate a helicopter, right? However much room a helicopter will take, that's what this will take. And so what we are going to do when we want to travel somewhere is I might be like, hey, I'm here in Columbia, South Carolina. I want to go to Charleston and walk in the Battery. If you've never been to Charleston, it's a beautiful city. I recommend it. And so, oh, I'm going to go have, you know, oh, and not only am I going to walk on the Battery and have lunch, but I like to have red wine with my steak at dinner. I will not be in any condition to fly home after that because one, one glass of wine, it just, it just leads to the next and the next and the next. And we're like, I got to get home, right? I mean, no way am I flying and I shouldn't even be driving. And so what is the future? The future is I whip out my phone and I say, take me to Charleston. And it says, fine, you be downtown at the building top or downtown at the parking garage. You be there in 13 minutes and 41 seconds and you're going to get your ride. And I will Uber there or I will hopefully, better than Uber, better than Uber, I'll ride my bike there, which is better than an Uber. Um, I'll, I'll get there the way I want to get there, which hopefully involves having the freedom of being able to walk, ride a bike get there in a way that's fun and healthy and is and it gets me out, outside and doesn't have me a slave to being cooped up inside you know some machine all day long um this is a freedom i think is to be cherished more and more is the ability to get outside and be in nature that's the ultimate luxury but um get downtown the way you want to get downtown the machine arrives and, and what i would hope what i would hope is they have a little like led board on the side that has your name on the side so it's like Austin Meyer, 415. Oh, I got my own airplane for 10 minutes. And, you know, and then you hop on board, off you go. Does it go very far? No. Does it go very fast? No. But it gets me around the state. And right. um, then it drops me off, the battery. I can walk around Charleston, have all I want to drink for dinner, all I want to drink. And, you know, I know it's time to back home, you know, three o'clock in the morning. Sure, be at the battery. I'll be there at, you know, 2.15 a.m. Down it comes and you go and then you're back. And what does this free you from? It frees you from traffic. It frees you from having to stay sober. It frees you from having to stay current. It frees you from having to be a good pilot. It frees you from having to own a car. It frees you from having to buy insurance. It frees you from maintenance. It frees you from every single thing that we think we're, we're, we're chained to and allows us to do one thing, move.
in three dimensions. Move in three dimensions. That is what we're left with. That's going to be the future. It is not every one of us own a flying car. In my opinion, it's better. That's what we're going to get. I like it. I love it. Yep. And uh, so the, the future coming will allow us to, to grab those. Maybe even some of them will do, be scheduled points that you can just go at any time, and they're always sure. going back and forth. Right. And be... but they're not going to go far and fast. Now, let's say I want to go to Paris. Yeah. Par uh, Charleston, Paris, two of my favorite cities. I'm not taking an eVTOL to Paris. Right. But I'll take an eVTOL from Columbia, South Carolina, up to uh, Charlotte Douglas. Mm -hmm. I'll land a little VTOL ramp at Charlotte Douglas, and it's just a nice little walk to the international terminal, and then we'll take the 787 to Paris. Why? Right. Because big, big, badass jet airplanes with their incredible energy density fuel and swept wings and turbine engines, that thing's going to run me there at Mach 0.8. Now, oh. I'll land at tra Paris Charles de Gaulle. Now we got an interesting question. Once I've landed at Paris Charles de Gaulle, you know I want to take an EV tall to the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> <laughs> but do the Parisians want a bunch of EV tolls going, you know, over their precious city? Maybe not. Maybe not. And so, you know, no matter how quiet they are, there's there's also something to be said for for commuting with nature and history and and not having these mechanical, you know, flies carrying people all over the place. And now it's now it's a cultural a cultural question. Thank you for clarifying all this for me. I mean yep. that very sincerely because this has, I have posed this type of question to many people, people in the industry, and so many people want to dodge it and, and, mm. and look at that, especially if they're working for, you know, big companies with big mm. investments saying that they are going to be everywhere all the time and, um, and, and they don't tackle the hard questions. You have, and I really do appreciate that. And what you're saying makes sense. I think yep. it's logical. And so oh, I can I actually wait. see it happening. Yeah, and I love owning my evolution. Let me be clear. I love the instrument currency checks now and the biennial flight reviews and the maintenance and the annual inspections and the because I love the whole professionalism and the learning. You know, I write my own checklist for my evolution. That's so fun because every time I screw something up in the airplane, like now I can make my checklist better, right? Another wonderful part of experimental, not certified airplanes. You make the airplane, the checklist, the operating handbook exactly the way you want. So I love that sense of accomplishment and, and expertise. But Let's face it, I only fly the thing once a weekend. I can't, yeah. I can't mix it with alcohol. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not operating at a professional enough level to use it for like, you know, everything. And so um, there's also something to be said for not, not owning a car, not owning an airplane, but having the transportation available as a service. And it's, yeah. gonna, it's going to go that way. There's no way around it because even with our cars, our cars spend more time in the garage accruing property taxes and insurance payments and car payments than they do actually driving us around. And right. with light planes, it's probably 10 times worse. Yeah. So um, the asset that will be most affordable is the asset that is constantly utilized because then the per hour cost, there's more hours you know, to amortize your fixed cost across. And so it's financially inevitable that uh, both cars and airplanes will be owned by a small number of corporations that rent them out on the cheap. And it's going to be very freeing, very, very freeing. That's a wonderful, wonderful view of the future. I really do appreciate yeah. it. We have so, so much more that we can talk about. I hope you'll come back on Social Flight Live so we can tackle some of this. Are, I want are, to we, hear already about, are we already out of time? We are. I want to hear about the, what your thoughts are on experimental yeah. aviation. I want to hear about all these other things. Will you come back, please? We've only just gotten started. <laughs> all right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah of course. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah well, of thank, course. Yeah. I feel like we, we, we were just starting to get warmed up. You know, Joe Rogan, he interviews people for three hours. And if, if the interview's going well, that three hours feels like 20 minutes. So I got to um, do more of that. I got to start letting the shows go for three hours then. I think someone will say yeah. that. It sure works for Joe Rogan. It's great. It's great. So, uh, yeah. All right. Well, I'm definitely down for more. We have not talked about patent trolling. Um, we haven't talked. Uh, you you brought up. Well, we haven't talked about Xavion, which is another app I wrote. But but that one never. Really oh, I want to talk about patent trolling. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the future of of uh, experimental aviation, which I think sure. is the big part mm -hmm. of what we've got in GA. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to have you back. All right. Let's make this a two-parter. I'm down. I'm down for the next session you got. You got it. Thank you so All much, right. Austin. Yep, thanks. Take care. Yep. 
And thank you for joining us and taking time out of your evening to join us again here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you all blue skies. Thank you.